So today we'll continue with like I will start the review. So I was going to do three problems actually. So let me put this down here. Actually, this was the second one I was going to do. It's problem 476. Okay. And then the third one I was going to do was as an example three was effect of finite zeros of transfer function on system response. So what we will do for basically this week is we'll finish these problems. Okay? That will be a good review of 3050 or what the equivalent, whatever. But you will see that uh, it also leads into chapter 5, especially the first problem. It's related to your lab. So let's get started in the sense and let's see. Okay, so the question was determine the transfer function. Let's find the transfer function. So basically, here is our system in feedback alpha over s times s plus beta. So this is our input x, this is our output y. So the question is find h bar, the tra closed loop transfer function, because we have feedback as y over x. And towards the end of the lecture, I'll recap the definition of poles and zeros, etc. Just looking at this example 3. But for now, let's focus on this. And this is called what? What is the signal called? The error signal. Okay. And basically, what kind of a controller is this? This is a proportional controller. And like we briefly discussed last class, the PID controller in the S domain is basically a proportional term plus an integral control plus the derivative. And why is 1 over S called the integral term? Because if you recall from 3050, our equivalent, uh, so recall, that if you have this, in the S domain, a transfer function of 1 over S, this implies, or if you take the inverse Laplace transform, you'll basically get in the time domain, x of t, but then this is simply the integral of the input, and that's your output, okay? So correspondingly, or the inverse of the integral is the derivative, and that's so it's, it's 1 over s, the inverse is s, so this is the derivative term. And basically, there are three main ideas, not only in 3720, but in control design. And I'll try to write this every lecture in the sense number first one is stability. Okay, and you, if you look at the syllabus, your syllabus is also just designed like this. That is, we will first go through stability, that is, you cannot control. A system that is unstable right? that doesn't make any sense although in this class that is in lab we'll be dealing with a DC motor and stability implies I mean an unstable system implies that the corresponding transfer function has poles in the right half plane a DC motor has a pole at zero okay this is actually the transfer function of a DC motor so your system is marginally stable you would see, you can say and in other words, bottom line is in lab, in this course, we'll not really deal with an unstable system, but this is the first thing we'll do in control design, that is you have to stabilize the system. Then, and steps two and three are actually, you could actually switch them around, and the whole process is iterative. That is, in step two, you basically minimize steady state error. And then in step three, we adjust or tune transient response. And you don't have to minimize steady state error first. You could adjust for the transient response and then minimize your steady state error. But minimizing steady state error is going to affect the transient response. So it's an iterative process, two and three, once you stabilize the system. And if your system becomes unstable as a result of doing this, you go back and stabilize it. Basically, it's an iterative process till you match 
whatever specifications we, we are given and we'll do an example of this with respect to this system towards the end of today's lecture. And sometimes you may not be able to match the spec, right? Your specs are governed by a variety of things. For example, in the case of a proportional controller, the gain bandwidth product of your amplifier or variety of things, right? So basically it's an iterative process, but these are the three main ideas. So speaking about the proportional controller, stability is tuned using KP, right? Now, out of KI and KD, which one do you think minimizes steady state error? The integrator or the differentiator? I mean, it's a 50-50 guess, but think about it. Well, not quite, right? In the sense, it's the integrator because if you think about it, if you put an integrator here, right? You can integrate out the error. So they use the integrator to minimize steady state error, and they use the differentiator to control transient response, okay? But again, when you modify one, the other... That is, if you adjust transient response, your steady state error is going to get affected. So this is an iterative process, but we'll revisit this throughout the course. And these are the three main ideas in this course. Uh, for example, to minimize steady state error, you have the concept of something called the order or the type of, not the order, sorry, the type of a system for adjusting transient response. You have root locus, you have body plots, but basically, again, 3720 is nothing new, right? It's basically concepts of 3050 like an ooh and an ah, that is, oh, I can do this and I can, ah, I can do that, right? So it's, all right. But for in this case, you just have a simple proportional controller. So we just have KP. So how do you, now, something else, right? And I'll write this down in the sense, usually, like if you think about it, this is, okay, this is your controller. Uh, let me use different colors in the sense. The topology, this is a standard topology. This is your controller. It is placed before the plant. Plant is the system to be controlled because you want your controller acting on your error. You don't want to put the controller in the feedback loop, okay? However, what could be in the feedback loop is what is called as, well, let me tell, ask you what this is called. So let me call this H bar of T S. Why do you, why, so why would you want to put this in the feedback loop? In the sense, what would this help with respect to the output and the input? Think DC motor, right? The input to the DC motor is a voltage, yes? Your output is angular shaft displacement, correct? What are the units of, well, voltage is volts. What about theta? What are the units of angular shaft displacement? Radians. So you obviously cannot subtract voltage from radians, right? They're different units. So what kind of a, what is the name for this system? You convert between different units. It starts with a T. For example, you take a speaker, right? Transducer, okay? So what you will usually have in the feedback loop is a transducer. I mean, it's convenient to put it here. You can move this transducer right here, okay? But you will see later in chapter five with block diagram simplification, how this transducer affects the uh, closed loop transfer function. But you'll also see an example of block diagram simplification. With this example it's itself, in the sense, suppose this was simply a wire, like we were, like we're doing right now. What is each bar if it's just a wire? So you understand the question? Suppose I don't want this transducer. Okay. I just want a wire. Yeah, so in other words, Y of S comes here, Y of S goes out, so what's H bar then? One. Is that clear? So for now, for us, well, let me just write this in. Let me just leave it as H bar of T. 
quantity of s and for us it's one okay all right so let's look at the closed loop transfer function so how would you do this well uh, the solution to the problem let me zoom out is basically i have my y bar the output over here is this transfer function times the input so it's alpha over s times s plus beta times the input which is k times the error signal right because this out this signal here is the output of this system which is the transfer function is k times the input which is the error signal so you get k times the error signal this dot is multiplied is that clear? Now what happens is this becomes alpha or s. So there's a k comes up here, but the error signal is x minus y. Correct? So from here, you can simplify and get the y's on one side. You've got to be careful. 1 plus k alpha over s times s plus beta equals yeah so you should be comfortable with all this math therefore y over s I mean y over x sorry is what So this becomes what if I simplify this further I get k alpha over s times s plus beta plus k alpha beta. so that's your closed loop transfer function so any questions on the math let me zoom out let me zoom out even further So here is your system, okay? And here is the derivation. It's pretty straightforward. But let me zoom in. What I'll do is I'll redraw the feedback system. And you tell me what can you see uh, from the result. So whenever you get a result, you should interpret it. That is, what do you understand from it? So what do you see from this result? Here's my x, here's my y. What do you see from it? Given this picture and given this transfer function, anything pops out? Nothing pops out? What pops out in your mind? You see this. Come on, something like, huh? No, not like physical realization. So, what, like, where do you see the k, the alpha? Like, I mean, alpha over s times s plus beta. So, in other words, if I ask you in general, If I had something like this, controller times the plant, can you tell me what the transfer function of this system is? What's y over x for this system? So what is your C here? In this case, what's your C? K, what's your P? This one, right? The more DC motor transfer function. So what's your closed loop transfer function? Yeah. 
Now look at this, right? So you have from this picture, you got this. So look at this expression. And then tell me what this would be. Exactly, right? And you can derive this. This is actually chapter 5. Block diagram simplification. Right? We'll cover this next week, but my point is, this is not new, right? Now, what happens if there is positive feedback? So let's say I put a plus there. So what do you think happens? Yes, exactly. Where's the minus? Where? Here? No. This one, exactly, right? So as an engineer, you're like, wait, that's what it should do, and that's what it does. You can actually derive this and prove this, and we'll do this in chapter five. What do you think happens with the transducer, okay? So if I put a transducer here, here the gain of the transducer is one, right? If it wasn't, you can go back and even figure that out, right? But exactly, but where? Chris is right. So the question is, where do you do it? And, well, I'll leave you, we'll wait till chapter 5, right? This is, sorry? It's not the top, right? It's the bottom, if I remember right. Okay. No, not this one, no, no, no. This one is like kind of special, right? This one comes because of this. Okay, so like you have an X minus Y here. Okay? So you can see this Y so if you had a transducer, okay, this won't be Y anymore, yeah? It'll be HT times Y. So it goes on the other side. See, this one comes because of this Y. You see that? This never gets affected, okay? Unless, of course, you decide to put something here. But that's not part of the feedback loop. Sorry, the feedback system. So again, there's all this block diagram simplification. You should not memorize all this. Right? You can, with the event, with enough practice, you should remember all this. And there's a there's a very specific term for this product. Okay, this is called as the numerator, right? The open loop gain. Why? Because if there was no feedback, if I chop this off, right, I have only the product of these two. You see that? That's another reason why the transducer comes only in here, okay? If, if I had a transducer with a non-unity gain. So we'll look at all these terminology in chapter 5, but you can understand this general formula from this very specific example, actually, okay? All right, let's do a further review of pole zeros and second-order standard form, tra standard form of a second order transfer function. So first thing is, what are poles and zeros? So poles are defined as values of S for which, this is the general definition, H of S goes to plus or minus infinity, okay? This is the general definition. DFN is an abbreviation for definition. Actually, I'll write it out. This means definition. Okay. But for us, we will use they are finite roots of the denominator for a polynomial sorry, for a rational Ah. transfer function, okay? In other words, they are the roots of the denominator polynomial for a rational transfer function. So rational transfer function means our transfer function is of the form P over Q, okay? And the degree of Q is strictly greater than the degree of of P, right? If not, I can divide it, right? I mean, that is if I have, for example, S cube over S, that's S squared, right? So that's why this needs to be there. So it's poles, 
and zeros or consequently values of s for which our transfer function tends to zero this is again the general definition what we will use is finite roots of the numerator for a rational transfer function again rational transfer function I've written up there what it is I'm not going to repeat it okay now the second very important idea from 3050 is so this is basically recall was chapter 5 basically chapter 5 idea whatever okay so what is do you remember the standard form of a second order transfer function what was it you remember omega n squared over s squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared okay what is zeta called as the damping coefficient or the damping ratio so for example for underdamped what is the range of zeta you remember yes okay and omega n is called the natural frequency of oscillation okay the units of uh, so this is dimensionless okay it's a ratio yes this fellow, what are the units of omega? What are the units of omega? In general, what are the units? Angular velocity. Yep, radians per second, and the other one's dimensionless, right? And also recall that the second order poles, it's minus zeta omega n plus or minus square root of. 1 minus zeta squared omega n j all right you remember this guy actually i don't remember this so let me i'm a little skeptical about this let me just derive this uh, so the roots are minus b plus or minus square root of b squared yeah that was right what i wrote minus 4ac over 2 times a okay this is minus zeta omega n plus or minus so what i'll do is i'll factor out a negative 4 omega n squared okay so that is the square root of that is 2 omega n j in other words the reason why i factor out a negative 4 is so i can get write this as 1 minus zeta squared omega n and then i get the j okay Remember, this guy was defined as omega d, the damped frequency of oscill oscillation. So in the pole zero pl plane, okay, so we had underdamped, okay, this was minus zeta omega n. Uh, this fellow was square root of 1 minus zeta squared omega n this fellow was minus actually there is the j there which I conveniently forgot okay and this was what you remember what was the hypotenuse and you can compute it I claim it was omega n so uh, note the hypotenuse h is square root of this length squared plus that length squared correct so it's one minus zeta omega n that's the length okay squared plus this fellow squared so basically you get square root of well, square root of omega n squared 
minus zeta squared omega n squared plus zeta squared omega n squared. This cancels. So this square root is positive because we are considering a length, right? In other words, it's just a positive square root there. It's omega n. This angle theta, recall, so note 1, note 2, cosine of theta is adjacent side over the hypotenuse. In other words, is zeta. So remember that if I move the poles along this radial line, my damping ratio doesn't change. Okay? So these are all some ideas which you want to recall from your equivalent of 3050. But let's do like an ex what is the word? Let's do an example using this. Uh, system, feedback system to finish up this lecture. Let me copy this. So let's do a follow-up problem. That is, uh, so here's a question. So we can review all this. Suppose alpha equals one, beta equals two, determine k such that we have an underdamped response, okay? So solution is underdamped response to a step input for x of s. There you go, right? Solution, we already, we need a transfer function computed h bar is y over x and I want to use the simplified form since I'm going to say this is k alpha over s times s plus beta plus k alpha correct and well if you don't let's go back up here just check there it is okay now if you expand this out You have k alpha over s squared plus beta s plus k alpha. Okay, so this let's call this equation one. Now compare one to our standard form for second order, and this is actually let's just plug this in. Uh, let's see, alpha is one, right? So this is alpha equals 1, beta equals 2. Okay. Uh, so the standard form is what? Omega n squared over s squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. So you just want to multiply. Okay. So we want an underdamped response. Okay? So we have to pick a zeta between 0 and 1. The actual value I haven't given in the problem because it the value you in a real problem there'll be probably like a range of zeta which is tolerable. Okay. In this case, let's just pick a zeta of 0.5. And I did this in my morning section, it worked out very nicely. Zeta is 0.5, say, okay? So can you use this to compute K for me? How? So Chris is nodding his head, so how do you? That's correct, you can. So how do you do it? Yes, 2 zeta omega n. Now, 2 zeta omega n equals 2. You understand where you got it from? You can compare these two. This is in standard form. Yeah, omega n is square root of k. So let's plug that in. And now you can see why this works out very well. 2 times 1 half times square root of k equals 2. 
this implies k equals 4. It's got some units depending on what x and y are, but for now, it's like dimensionless, right? So k equals 4. Okay? Any questions on this? All right. So this highlights something very important. Before you even get into MATLAB, you should always do hand calculations. And you should, or in other words, you should have an idea of what the answer is going to be, what you can expect, etc. Do not, under any circumstances, do trial and error with MATLAB. Okay, and try to fudge the theoretical calculations. It doesn't work. Because practically speaking, it's not only it's unethical. You just you you can't get an answer. Right? There's too many variations, and you just can't like keep around like keep like blindly moving around, mucking around in the dark. Right? It just doesn't work. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to check our answer in MATLAB. Oh, so let's take a look. Ooh, so my MATLAB. Hopefully, it starts pretty quickly. And that's where we'll end today's lecture. After we do example, after we do a check our answer in MATLAB. Now, caution, right? The way you can specify your system in MATLAB, there are, I won't say infinite, but there are a variety of ways. Okay? I use one way. The point is to be consistent. Let's see. These are the times when I'll pause the lecture. It's taking so long. Then we'll continue. Start up finally. Okay. So, so S is transfer function. So this is how I define the transfer function. I declare a transfer function object, right? And the point is, this can be uh, any variable. Right? I use S. And where does this TF come from? It comes from let me turn on the more facility so you can scroll is enable scrolling is enabled it comes from the control system toolbox right and if it'll ever get through yeah i don't know why it's so slow this no it was much faster in the morning much faster there it is okay so it's part of the control system toolbox and there are many ways to define transfer functions, right? I use one way, and I'm not going to, no, here it is. Okay. So you can de define it as a numerator polynomial, denominator polynomial, a lot of examples here, right? So right there, but I'm just going to do one way, which is S is transfer function of S. And again, you can just do something like this, right? H is one over transfer function of S plus three. there but it's much easier to say this is a variable and then let's do let's make k as 4 because that's my control parameter right you can also define an alpha and a beta but for simplicity i'm not going to do that you can specify the transfer function outright as k times 1 over s times s plus b beta is 2 plus k you can do that right or what I can do is I can be more tricky, not well, not tricky, elegant. I can use this command called feedback. So this is the topology, and it assumes negative feedback. Okay. So negative feedback is assumed. So what I'm going to do is my m2 is one, my m1 is k times alpha over s times s plus beta. So I'm just going to say my h is feedback. Okay of k times alpha is 1 over s times s plus beta, which is 2. I'm going to put extra parentheses here because that's my second system, yes? 1, right? And it's unbalanced. So what did I... So that's that. M1, did I miss something? Let's see, it's that, that's that. Oh, okay. There, parentheses. Okay. That's what we got, right? 
So let's step this. And step is another um, command that is part of the control system toolbox. One, the one reason why this could be taking this long is because I didn't shut down my tablet. I actually put it into sleep mode. Yeah, I wasn't recording this morning. That's right. So characteristics. So here's my step response. Okay. It's underdamped for sure. You don't have any steady state error actually, interestingly, right? Because your step, when you use the step command, it assumes a unity step. You can see that, right? The dots. But let's be absolutely sure that we are actually getting 0.5 damping ratio. So if you right click and you go to characteristics, let's look at the peak response. There is the peak time, but if you actually left click over there, and I click double clicked or something, I'm getting an error. I shouldn't get this error. Anyway, the overshoot is 16.3%. So let's use the percent overshoot and compute our zeta. And that'll be the final part of this lecture, the sense. Now, from MATLAB, percent overshoot was what, 16.3? 16.3. You remember the expression for percent overshoot in terms of zeta? It was e to the minus zeta pi over square root of 1 minus zeta squared times 100% equals 16.3. This implies e to the minus zeta pi over square root of 1 minus zeta squared equals 0.163. So if you solve for this, and I'm going to use the TI-89 just to show a different, and I do have a TI-89 emulator on here. There it is. So you, well, you just know how to use the TI-89 to solve this. You can also use MATLAB or Wolfram Alpha. There it is. So let me go algebra solve e to the minus x times pi divide by, now you know we need a keyboard for this. My, oops, negative x times pi divide by, actually, My square root there is square root of one minus x squared equals point one six three solve for x and hopefully I didn't mess this up approximate point five okay so good so that's our verification Okay, so for those of you from the morning section, this is what I've decided to do. I'll record my morning lecture video. This would have been the video for the morning section. For the afternoon section, uh, we'll just go through something similar on the board. So I won't record like two videos because it's, it's the same thing, right? Okay, so tomorrow is your lab. So uh, let's see, I got only a couple of minutes. So what I want you to do for people in both sections is I want you to print out the lab before you come in, okay? I'm not going to print it out for you, so please print it out. Oh, let's see. So the lab is already online, like I said. Uh, so if you go in here, Seven twenty. course materials. So please, I want you to print out this lab. And there is a chance you might finish this lab tomorrow, which is fine, right? It extends to next week. And lab one, like I said, also has guidelines on like, well, not only on the MATLAB commands, but it also has guidelines on the project report stuff, right? So go through it, uh, lab write-up style. So here it is, okay? So again, please print this out and bring it tomorrow, and I'll see you tomorrow.